such a simple joy, such a profound sacrifice. When we get it right, it's all we ask, is one who God is. It is a pouring out of ourselves, a letting go, a surrender. It is lavishing our love, our hopes, our hurt, our very lives on the one who does it. And in that breaking, we are made whole. In the giving, we receive. In the pouring out, we are filled. In loving the unchanging God, the unmoving rock of ages, our hearts of stone are transformed. When we give all we are to Him, we are shaped into glorious destinies. Let our souls be shaped. It's all about you. It's all about you. So we continue our Shaken series today, and communion is always such a beautiful privilege for us because it frames for us the way the sacrifice of Jesus is what truly sustains us. His broken body is what gives us life. His blood poured out for us is what restores us and redeems us. It's because of his sacrifice that we can stand in the presence of God, that we're invited to the table and that we are called God's children and his friends. In the Shaken series, we've been speaking about worship. We looked at the gift that worship is, the privilege it is for, be, for us to be able to come into the presence of God and that that makes us unshakable when we can stand in the reality of his love and his goodness. And then last week, Cray shared about David and about how he found true worship and freedom and authenticity in giving himself to God, just with reckless abandon, despite what everyone else thought and his own fears, how he shook up the status quo in worship. And today, we're speaking about how our souls need to be shaken as we worship God, we're talking about the sacrifice of worship. And communion is such a powerful way to start because we are reminded that as Jesus sacrificed everything for us, our sacrificing for him is the only logical response. He died for us to find life and fullness. And he asks us to die to self so that we can enter into his life. He invites us into true freedom in worshiping him with everything that we are, an ordering of our lives and our loves and our priorities, putting him first. And when we do that, we find that we are truly free, and yet it is deeply sacrificial. True worship has to be sacrificial because I have to remove everything else from the throne of my life. Think about it like this. There is a, a throne on your heart and only one thing can be on there at a time. And sometimes we put things on that throne. Sometimes we end up worshiping certain things or certain dreams or ideals and that really is the thing that drives us. More often than not, we are on the throne and we worship ourselves, our own comforts, our own ego, our own pleasure. And so to worship at all, we have to make a sacrifice. We have to make the decision to take whatever else is on that throne, whatever's easy, whatever's comfortable, to take it off the throne and to decide instead that that is only for God. We have to be willing to lay down ourselves in order to find life. Jesus said it like this in Mark chapter 8. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. And then he said this very profound thing, for whoever loses their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. Yet what, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? In order to follow Jesus and to live a life that really honors him, a life of worship, we have to die to ourselves. We have to be willing to sacrifice. True worship is always sacrificial. And so today I'd like to share some thoughts with you about what the sacrifice really looks like, the cost of the sacrifice, the courage of the sacrifice, and the power of the sacrifice. So firstly, what is the cost of sacrificial worship? 
until the time of Jesus when he came and instituted the new covenant, which we share today in communion, worship was always very clearly understood to be associated with sacrifice or with offerings. Something had to die to atone for your sin, and so you didn't ever come to the temple empty-handed. You always came with something. You either dragged some animal there, or you came with a grain offering or with something tangible that you were going to give in response in worship. At the start of our series, we looked at the last bit of Hebrews chapter 12, in which the author draws this comparison for us between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Mount Sinai, where the Israelites got the law, it's the mountain of fear and trembling, and then it's juxtaposed with Mount Zion, the mountain of joy, where we come to worship in freedom because of the sacrifice of Christ. The author is trying to show how Jesus fulfilled the things from the Old Testament and instituted a new way of existing in the world and relating to God. And this continues in Hebrews chapter 13, where we read this about the way in which worship has, has shifted because of the coming of Jesus. You can read with me from Hebrews 13 verse 11. The high priest carries the blood of the animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. I wouldn't have made a very good priest in the Old Testament because blood and guts and gore is really not my thing, so I'm very glad about this. So Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased." In the Old Testament times, you'd have to bring that poor animal or some other sacrifice, some other costly gift to be able to commune with God. But here, what is the author of Hebrews tells us? Because Jesus has become for us the ultimate sacrifice, let us now offer God what? The sacrifice of praise. And don't forget to do good and to share with others because those are the things, the sacrifices that please God. The sacrifices God asks of us are our worship, our praise, our living out godliness and Christ-likeness in the world. And that frames things quite differently. What if I think about the things I do, the way I relate to people, the way I deal with my boss or my colleagues, the work that I offer? What if I think about those as sacrifices of praise, as offerings that I bring in worship to God? We don't have to sacrifice physical things and little animals, thankfully. But to worship, real worship, is always sacrificial. And I think that, that sacrificial system in the Old Testament made very clear the gravity of worship. It made it very clear that it had a big cost and that it was something very significant. Maybe it would help us if we had to drag a goat with us every time we wanted to bring God an offering because it's a very tangible thing, but for us, I think we can become a little bit flippant about it. Our access to God is so freely available to us that we forget that in order to really worship, it is sacrificial. I love the story of David, and Cray spoke about him a bit last week, about this true and dignified worship in David's heart, but that doesn't mean he always got it right. In fact, he very often got things wrong. And in one of the crises that he faced during his reign, he had taken a census very specifically against the explicit instruction of God. God wanted him to trust in his power, not in the number of fighting men he had in his army. But David wanted a list, he wanted to know. And so he took the census against God's direction and things didn't go very well, shocker, when you don't listen to God. Um, there was this plague that came on the whole nation. And so eventually David takes responsibility and he's trying to do damage control and he really is repenting for his role in all of this. And he comes to the threshing floor of a man named Aruna where he is to make a sacrifice to God. And so we pick up the story from 1 Chronicles 21 from verse 23. 
Aruna said to David, take it. Let my lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give you the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give you all of this. And that stuff isn't cheap. He's giving him a lot of significant things. But David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Aruna 600 shekels of gold for the site. Far be it from me to offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. And I wonder how often do we bring small sacrifices that don't really cost us anything. The bare minimum to tick the box. And now please hear me, those of you who are nervously clutching your wallets, because I'm not really talking about money here. I think money is just an indicator of your heart. But I'm not really talking about that kind of offering. I'm talking about just the way that we approach our relationship with God. Those Old Testament sacrifices were really expensive in a farming community, livestock and grain. Those things are your livelihood. So yes, they were expensive from a financial perspective, but it was more than that. To come to the temple, you had to walk long distances. You had to sacrifice time and energy and effort. And I wonder for myself, I know sometimes I come to worship thinking a lot more about what I can get than what I can give. Worship is a wonderful experience for us, and when we come and enter into God's presence, He is so gracious in that He meets us in this place, but it's just a secondary benefit, really, about worship. It's not its purpose. Stormy O'Martian says, isn't it just like our Lord to make something that's all about Him the thing that blesses us most when we do it? But me getting something out of it, that's a secondary consequence. It's not the reason that we worship. We come to bring an offering. And as David says, how can we bring an offering that costs us nothing? And what does Hebrews tell us is the offering that God wants us to bring? It's our praise and our love and the way we love others. And sometimes praise really is a sacrifice. When I'm in pain, when I'm feeling lost and confused, when God hasn't shown up for me the way that I've hoped and prayed and trusted, but when I choose in that place to come and stand and declare His goodness, that is sacrificial worship. When I choose to proclaim God's goodness, when I currently don't see it or experience it, that's an amazing act of costly faith and worship. It's removing myself from the throat and saying, God, I don't understand, but you're still good. God, I can't feel you, but I trust that you're still there. God, I don't know how to carry on, but I'm going to hold on to you. When it's hard to do good to others, when it's much easier to be selfish, which is always, let's be honest, when it's difficult and maybe even relationally or financially costly to stand with integrity, and not to bow to the pressure when it's hard to love people and I choose to do it anyway. That is sacrificial, costly worship. That is an offering that delights the heart of God. So the sacrifice is firstly costly and secondly, the sacrifice is courageous. There's a beautiful story about this kind of costly, courageous worship that we read about in the Gospels. And the different Gospel authors tell it to us from slightly different vantage points. But I want to read to us from Luke 7, um, from verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She stood behind him and weeping, sorry, behind him at his feet and weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, this woman is just identified as a sinful woman, and she arrived at a Pharisee's house, no less. That's like a a bit of a a party-crashing moment there that was not well looked on by the rest of the people there. Already Jesus is eating with the Pharisee. There's already tension. And now this woman just comes in, barges in through the, the crowd, kind of uninvited. 
But whatever happened, she made her way to Jesus and she just came and lavished her love on him in a pretty awkward way, to be honest, because I think we have this idealized picture of things in the Bible sometimes, like this children's Bible caricature picture of this woman. But can I just say, as someone with wild hair, I read this and I'm like, <clears throat> have you ever noticed how non-absorbent hair is? So now she's crying enough to wet someone's feet. That's not a gentle, ladylike kind of cry. That's a that's the ugly cry. Now, you, she's ugly crying on his feet, and then she uses her hair to try and wipe it up. Imagine what she looked like when she stood up again. Thank goodness, I think the women wore head coverings. So I think that was her only saving grace. But this was not a pretty picture. It was wild, and it was courageous. We don't know exactly what this woman's story was before, but she's branded a sinful woman. <laughs> it's always a lovely title. So it wasn't a pretty story. She was a reject and an outcast. She wasn't welcome in that place. She had no social value. But Jesus changed all that because he set her free. And he gave her a new start by reminding her that God saw value in her. And so she came just to worship him. She had no other agenda. She didn't care about the other people in the room. She just came to lavish her love on him. And it was a wildly courageous sacrificial act. She pulled out that perfume on Jesus, which in other places they tell us it was about a year's wages that that perfume cost. But that's not what sets her apart. What really sets her apart is that Jesus said this about her in Matthew 26. He says, I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. He's saying that in his larger story, she would be immortalized not as a sinner, but as a worshiper. And it all came from that scandalously courageous act of sacrificial worship that was born out of gratitude. And this account always unsettles me. And I think it's meant to unsettle us. It's meant to make us very uncomfortable because this, this act of worship is so outrageous. She purposefully makes a scene. She disrupts the dinner. She doesn't care what else is going on. She just wants to pour out her love and her very expensive perfume on Jesus and her tears. She just humiliates herself to show him gratitude. And what do we do? I think sometimes, if we're honest, we're happy to worship God as long as it doesn't inconvenience us too much as long as it doesn't get in the way of the other things we want to do, as long as it doesn't take too much time or too much money or too much, you know, just general annoyance out of the day I have planned and the things I have to do, as long as it doesn't interfere with my other plans, as long as it suits me, as long as it serves me. But that isn't worship at all. Worship is sacrificial. It costs us and it requires courage. Thirdly, when we worship in costly and courageous ways, we experience the power of the sacrifice. That woman who anointed Jesus had a very different legacy after that day than the one she started out with because she was willing to worship. And we can too. We can be transformed when we learn not just to offer our songs and our praise and our good works, but when we offer all that we are to God as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says it like this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is what true worship looks like, to offer all I am to God. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In some ways, when we worship God, we do have to drag a sacrifice with us. We have to drag ourselves. We have to bring ourselves as living sacrifices and keep laying them down on the altar. We have to bring God our heart and our love and that is our true and proper worship. When we do this, we'll be able to be transformed. Then we will be able to know what God's will is. 
and then we will find purpose and freedom and life. There is so much power in sacrificial worship to touch God's heart and to change us. Often I think we feel like we have this very transactional understanding of God. Like we, if I sacrifice something, it's going to move him to, to bless me or to do something. But the reality is God blesses us and he loves us regardless of what we do. Often the sacrifice is for me. It's for me to remember who God is and who I am because I live much better in the world when I have the right perspective of that. But it does bless the heart of God. There's a part of the story of the sinful woman anointing Jesus that has struck, stuck so powerfully in my mind over the years. Um, in a home group many years ago, our home group leaders shared this sort of picture of this woman and it still really stirs my heart every time I think about this, this story. He spoke about how this woman came and poured this perfume on Jesus and um, the, in, in Luke's part, he just tells us that he was, you know, he was focused on the feet and the hair and all the stuff that was going on. But in other places, it tells us that she poured the perfume over Jesus' head um, and just anointed him in this, um, this huge vial of very expensive perfume. And so, you know, I mean, perfume is something that you spritz or you dab. It's not something you just like pour with the buckets over yourself. So Jesus was anointed by this woman, and she poured this extremely expensive, really strong stuff all over him. And in one account in Matthew, it tells us that this happened just before the Last Supper. And so given the fact that this was a lot of very strong perfume, and the fact that in those days they didn't exactly shower every day, chances are that when Jesus was heading into the, the Last Supper and the cross and all of those things, the smell was still kind of hanging on him. And he says he wonders whether when Jesus went out into the Garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating blood, his pores didn't emanate some of that smell. And as he was trying desperately to bring himself to make that final decision once and for all, to sacrifice himself for us, he didn't get a whiff of that perfume and remember that woman's sacrifice and think, I can do it. And I wonder whether as those whips pierced his flesh as they beat him. He didn't every now and again just get a whiff of that perfume and if his heart wasn't strengthened by it. And as the crown of thorns pierced his head, I wonder whether he didn't smell some of that perfume and whether it didn't make him strong enough and courageous enough to keep going. As I think about my own worship, my own sacrifices that I make for the sake of loving Jesus, how do they honor him and bless his heart? Is my worship a fragrant offering, a beautiful gift, a profound sacrifice? And is it worthy of the king that I serve? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of yourself that you have given us. And so may we be moved, Lord, with gratitude for the one who gave it all for us. May we be willing to come with surrender. May we lay it all down again, Lord God, because you are worthy. And not only are you worthy, Lord, but in giving ourselves, in laying down our lives, we find them. So may we worship you, Lord Jesus, with all that we are. Teach us what it means to be a living sacrifice. May our worship be a fragrant offering that pleases you, Jesus. In your holy name. Hi, Hope Bridge uh, online community. It's so good to be with you today. And as we continue with our worship series, one of the greatest acts of worship that we see in Scripture is Christ's sacrifice for humanity. His worship to the Father to re reunite humanity with, with His Father. And um, we see that played out at the Last Supper where we are reminded of that sacrifice that Jesus um, performed for us on the cross that He reunited us with the Father by sacrificing His own life. Um, and there's no greater act of worship 
um, then to reunite humanity with, with the Father. So Christ did that for us, and on the night that He was betrayed, He portrays this to His disciples who are sitting around the table with Him. He picks up a loaf of bread like He had done many times before, and He must have said to them, this is my act of worship to the Father, and you need to do the same. You need to act in the same way to, to give your lives up as a living sacrifice um, to the Father. And he breaks the bread and he says, this will be my body for you. Broken, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he, he lifted up a chalice of wine. And he looked at his, each of his disciples in the eye and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we remember Christ's blood poured out, um, we are remembered that we are renewed and restored to the Father because of the sacrifice, because of this act of ultimate worship from Jesus to the Father. We are restored. We are renewed. And as His blood drips to the floor, it's like healing rain as we, as we sang that song today. Um, but it's, it's this absolute um, act of worship to the Father that Jesus reveals to us and says, go and do likewise. Go and be my hands and my feet as they are pierced to the world around so that they can see the love of the Father through the Son the, the, on display for the world to see through us. That is the church's mandate, to go and be all that Christ has called us to be um, as our act of worship to the Father to portray to the world the Son. So let's pray together as we partake in this meal together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the heart of worship. We thank you for the gift that you bring us through your Son. That we can stand in awe and wonder of who you are. And as we do that, may that be our heart's declaration to the world. That we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one who broke himself, poured out every drop of blood, so that we may be reunited with the Father. For that we are eternally thankful. We pour out our lives again as an act of worship. Not just in singing songs, but in bringing ourselves to the cross. As we remember that which, which maybe dis, dis, displeases the Father. Things in our lives that we need to come and, and bring repentance to God for. I pray that we would do that now. So, Lord God, as part of our worship, we bring our repentance. We bring our asking of forgiveness from the Father because of the greatest act of worship. So, as we bring ourselves with all our brokenness, with all our faults, with all our mistakes, we know that the restoration because of Christ's worship to you is our redemption. It's our sacrifice that we get to bring ourselves now because of what Christ has done. So we bring our, our need for repentance, we bring our need uh, for your sacrifice again and a reminder of what you have done for us. And as we, we um, receive from you, we hear the words uh, that you uttered with your last breath, it is finished. We no longer are on the outskirts, but we are drawn into the throne room of grace to worship wholeheartedly the King of Kings. So thank you for that privilege. Thank you for that opportunity to engage with you, to be in intimate relationship with you. And may that be our heart's cry of worship as we desire more of that in our lives. We thank you for this meal together and we pray that you would remind us daily going from this place that you are the living sacrifice and the heart of worship that we need to strive to really be a part of in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you. Sing it again. I surrender. I surrender.
Sing it one more time. Sing, I surrender. I surrender.